thank uh, the organizer for inviting me here for this nice conference. And uh, one other thing is that uh, thanks to all the speakers, previous speakers, who had made my job easier. And uh, third one is that, you know, uh, I apologize to all mathematicians or whoever here, is for uh, this small thing. Like, you know, so when a physicist talk of a phase diagram, you have a phase diagram and there are two sides. And, you know, you do not know the exact line, of course. And, you know, if you do simulations, you get a line, you know, and you get both sides. There is a little small, you know, very small probability like, a, you know, small probability that the whole, both, phase, both sides may not exist and the curve is just a fictitious curve. But that probability is very low, right? It's like happening a tornado here or something like that. So, right, you know, with that much of risk, that, you know, with the exact mathematical results someday could make all this phase diagram which you talk might disappear. With that risk, we proceed. And what I, when I'm going to talk about a phase diagram or I talk about a critical exponent, and with that much of belief we go, we, we don't have a proof or a theorem about most of the things which I talk about. Sometimes you have, but mostly we don't. There are conjectures, yeah. But most of it, yeah. So I would, uh, uh, because this, this is on sand pile models, I will give a physicist view on the sand pile models and why we study sand pile models. So basically, uh, as we know, criticality itself, as a criticality or what you call scale invariance or power laws are a behavior at a critical point, okay? So power laws or scale invariance are associated with criticality. So for example, in a magnetic system, you have a critical point here, the susceptibility diverges, specific heat diverges, so this divergence at the critical point is, is a power law, okay? So that's what you call, or the magnetization goes to zero, so there is a power law here. And, but then in all critical phenomena, whatever we see in nature, you have a tuning parameter, right? I mean, you tune temperature and hold the system exactly here to see scale invariance. But, Right, you know, but that is usually hard because uh, the exact critical point you do not know, right, you know, mathematical critical point you know. So whatever you study is either above or below, right, you know, even if you study numerically, okay. So uh, basically, but on the other hand, many natural systems exhibit criticality without tuning. And this, when this happens, we call it self-organized criticality, okay? And uh, uh, I'll give you some examples, uh, some, you know, some small set of examples of all the examples I know. It's like rainfall, so different years. And when you have a power law, so a large number, okay, large event is a part of the power law. It is not a, it, it's the part of the power law, but it's not part of a exponential because, you know, the probability of getting a large number in exponential distribution is very large. So power law basically means sporadic large events, which you see during rainfall or earthquakes or many, you know, so if you look, plot them, you know, you find there are power laws there. There are very, very interesting thing is criticality in the brain. So, for example, here, you know, a mouse is anesth anesthetized. And you know, at different parts, a different time, after, after this, you try to measure what is the brain activity here and the distribution of that. So you can see that you know, when you go, when you wake up completely after some 80, 80 minutes, so you see a power law. The activity actually follow a power law. So it's a very nice thing to know why power laws are there in nature. And so the oldest uh, thing, OK, the uh, oldest thing is a Bechtang Weizenfeld model of sand piles. But before that, let me tell you what sand piles are, okay? So uh, when you talk of sand piles, right, I mean, you know, what the phenomena which you are talking about, a critical behavior without tuning, okay? So a simple example is that if you take a bottle cap and start pouring sugar into it, it will take a conical shape. You are dropping one by one. And then if you, you know, once you make a cone like that, if you drop one more grain, it will make some disturbances. Sometimes the disturbances can be as big as the system size. You drop one grain, the disturbances, you know, all over the system. So the, the, the disturbances, the perturbations actually goes all the way to the system size, which means that the correlation length of the system is probably infinity or as big as the system size. So basically, instead of a bottle cap, if you take, you know, a glass or a truck load of sand, the same phenomena will occur and it is independent of the system size, okay? So that's the way this sand pile actually inherently has a critical behavior. No, but you can imagine that this, if it is, even if you put that, this will happen. So this is actually experiment. So you have a sand grain, you know, 
know, you have a tabletop, and then grains are dropped here, and you make this sense, and you know, you find out the bust, whatever the avalanche is here, you, you know, approximately it uh, gives you a power law, okay? So, uh, so now to describe this, this is uh, the sand pile, and to describe this, we have this uh, stochastic sand pile models, which is, uh, you know, already discussed by Punyabrutho and many other people. So the stochastic sand pile, you know, in the stochastic sand pile, you have a lattice in 1D, one dimension, you have a lattice, and then, you know, we have some number of grains, you add a grain here, and the dynamics is that anything which is more than two is active, like uh, what he mentioned. But I'm using a rule here that when, whenever something is active, or you evacuate all the sand from here and distribute each one independently of the others to one of the neighbors. Okay, so if it is, you know, if you make two, this one can, you know, one, this both of them decide to go here, so it becomes three, this becomes zero, and it is the way it propagates, and now this becomes two, this is active, this will throw now here, and this, the, and, the, and you go to a state where everywhere you have one particle. So this one is now absorbing, because it's dead, th there is no activity, okay? So basically, if I call the height variables are z, z greater than one is active, and active is kind of whatever red here, and Z01 is inactive, any, any, any system which has uh, less than two particles everywhere, uh, you call it inactive, sorry, it, you call it observing state, okay, inactive or observing state or fixing state or fixation state or whatever you call it, so observing state, okay. So this model is introduced in 1991, and uh, so now question is that given this as a model, what are the things people uh, study? Hmm? Given all these sand piles, what exactly, what are the things, yeah, please. To, to, but um, you know, for me, I will give you a better model by doing this, and that is that you would be interested in. So what happens is that if you take two at a time, then you don't have a very good continuum limit, okay? But if you have all, if you take all grains out of the site, what you can think of a sand pile model, which is con which you have a continuous variable at each site, and all you do is that if something is more than one, right? I mean, you know, if you have the variable is more than one, you randomly some fraction put to the left, and rest you put to the right, okay? So it's a very nice continuous version, and we study also the continuous version, and there is the advantage in studying that. That's the reason we are studying it, okay? Okay, I think that's a good model, right, for you? <laughs> the continuous version, right? Yes, continuum, very, continuum, you know, you have a conti con, you know, real number everywhere, and uh, if it is more than one, you just break into two parts and mm, put it in the neighbor. And keep doing it. No, whole thing. Okay. So, okay. So, in sand piles, what exactly you study? <clears throat> so, what uh, what one studies usually is avalanche statistics. Okay. So, uh, as you know, so when the avalanche is going on, you don't drop additional grains. When the avalanche stops, you add a particle, and then so in the system you have a drive. And then there is a dissipation at the boundary, okay? So these two together, the balance takes the system to a critical state. And once you reach the critical state, and that how you reach the critical state, how do you know that you have reached the critical state? There has been a lot of discussions over uh, last uh, two, three days. So uh, yeah, we'll ask such questions also here. But once you reach the critical state, you add one, add one particle and try to follow what kind of avalanches it creates, which of the sites it is activating. And then statistics of avalanche basically means that distribution of mass, which is the to total number of sites, maybe the total number of sites which are affected, and width, I mean, you know, when the avalanche propagate, how far it goes, uh, width, or the duration, how long the avalanche pa persists. So you can look at the distribution of all, 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 of, this, all of this, and you get some power loss, okay? So, to, 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 to mimic the self-organized uh, systems, which I talk it here, like, you know, there is this burst of uh, activity. So in sand pile, once you have a power law, which means that actually the duration is sometimes so big and sometimes so small, and that's what you call criticality, okay, and power laws, okay? So this is, and you, so for each of them, you have exponent, and the exponents in, in, in a set, as a set, defines a universality, okay? So now what is the question, uh, why, why you are looking at this universality of stochastic sand piles? Okay, stochastic, particularly we believe that if with stochasticity, things are more general than without stochasticity. Okay, so this is the most generic kind of sand piles. 
And then uh, what we know is that if you, whatever, if you are looking at a critical state, the critical state is usually, usually is defined or is uh, uniquely characterized by the special dimension and certain key features, not the details, okay? So the criticality is governed by what you call relevant operators, okay? So now what we believe is that probably stochasticity is a relevant operator with respect to what you call deterministic models. And then the stochastic, if you want to put stochasticity, then you have a new universality class. Let us for the time being name it as Manna class, okay? So what you believe is that, you know, if you, whatever stochastic sand pile model you study, maybe, you know, eventually, you know, if you are looking at the critical state, it is uh, independent of how you do the dynamics and there is some kind of universality and there is a unique universality you want to name it as a Manna class. That's, that's, the, that's the one. It's like Ising model. If you study first nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor, or whatever, the critical temperature could differ, but the, in two dimension, the exponent beta will be one by eight. That's it. So that's the kind of thing we were looking for. So in this class, right, I mean, in this class of stochastic models, one important variant is what you call Oslo Senpai model, and I'm going to define uh, it for you now, okay? So until now, <laughs> what we know is that uh, uh, this self-organized criticality is, uh, because there is no tuning parameter, it is believed that it's probably a very different kind of mechanism. But in 1999, right, I mean, you know, so people, uh, it was proposed by this set of people and a series of paper afterwards that the, in absence of drive and dissipation, self-organized criticality can be viewed as an ordinary critical phenomena, ordinary observing state phenomena, okay? So, uh, so now question is that, you know, I'll, uh, so wh how, how is it that? So you can think of uh, an open system like that, which is the sand pile. And let us say that if your situation is like that, like, and if you drop a grain here, the point is that, you know, this will be absorbed because it will not create much disturbances. It will not create disturbances enough to go to the boundary. So it will be absorbed. So if you are here, the density of the thing will increase and will go towards this. But if it is here, like, you know, if the density is bigger than that, if you drop a sand, it will come towards that, okay? So if you are this side, you are attracted to this. If you are at this side, the dynamics actually attracts you to this point. So if you study a system without uh, drive and dissipation, if you close the system and the study the system with a smaller density, you will be here, larger density over here. And in a conserved sand pile model, if you change density, somewhere you will find a critical, critical point, rho c, okay? So that's the, that's the argument, which the paper is here, okay? So now, uh, question is that, you know, firstly, self-organized criticality now becomes ordinary observing state phase transitions, like, you know, we have a tuning parameter, okay? So now question that, is it good, is it bad, okay? So now, yeah, I'll, I, you know, at least the models I study, I'll show that it is true. Yeah. But, uh, but is there a general structure to say that it is not true? What is proven? What is proven is, but I'm not talking of critical values. What you call universality is not the critical values. Ising model, two dimension, nearest neighbor and second nearest neighbor has a two different critical temperature. But the, at the critical point, the exponents are same. If you say the critical threshold is different, I don't bother. Different models, different critical threshold. That's not the point. Point is that whether the critical behavior which is defined by the set of exponents. Are they different or they not? The proof, what is proofed? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, so that is not proved, right? What is proved is the threshold is not same. You prove me the exponents are not same. You know the exponents are not same. You don't. Yeah, okay. I think I, I, we, we discuss it later. I think that's not a proof, yeah. Yeah, so can you, right, I mean, maybe I can proceed and I will come. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so now, uh, what you have is that this kind of scenario, that uh, self-organized criticality is now an ordinary critical phenomena, brings in more questions into the picture. Because, in a, you know, uh, we know other models, which are of other models of observing transition, okay? One of the robust universality class of observing transition is directed percolation, where in a, right, you know, if something is infected, it infects its neighbor. If it is infected, it infects these neighbors. It's like 
This is the infection, this is the way the infection propagates. But if you look at the surface of a sand pile, you know, if you drop a grain, this has become unstable, they, they will make them their neighbors unstable, they will make their neighbors unstable, it will go like that. So as far as the description, description goes, what you call infection and what you call, you know, this activity, right, I mean, you know, the instability, these are kind of, you know, just by names. So on the surface of the sand pile, it appears like it's the infection process, okay? So now question, it comes, bring, and, and also you show that SOC and uh, this uh, fixed energy sand pile, right? I mean, they are the same thing, right? I mean, you know, the critical exponents are the same. So now, why, right? I mean, and in absorbing transition, you know that the most robust universality class is DP. So the question comes, why exactly that the self, you know, self-organized critical systems or sand piles do not show DP behavior? Right? I mean, you know, that's the question. So why generic sand piles, like, one, you know, are different from most generic and robust universality class of absorbing phase transition, namely directed populations? Why it is different? That's the question. So to answer this question, there can be three different scenarios. You say that, oh, well, manna class mm, has to be different from DP as there is the additional conservation law. Because in directed percolation, there is no conservation, right? I mean, no, the number of, so in Manna model, there is additional conservation. It has to be, that's the reason for it's being different. No, if you take close, you know, if you have a closed system, it's conservation. No, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, no, this is, I mean, closed and open are the same, uh, uh, right? I mean, no. But I just show here that, uh, the critical, this is the proposal, in absence of drive and dissipation, which means conserved, there no drive, no dissipation. SOC can be viewed as an ordinary critical behavior. So density is a fixed number. Okay? Both of them are doing, I'm doing both. So cur currently I'm just saying that, you know. So I'm talking of the conserved ones. The one where the density is fixed. I don't know. Then that's what, then that's the answer. You're taking an infinite system? Yes, L goes to infinity all the time. I mean, you know, finally, when you study critical, it is infinite That's system. The yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, but in simulation, you don't have, okay, anyway, you don't have a finite, but anyway. So, uh, so this is one, one way to say that Manna class has to be different because there is a conservation law. Other answer is that, well, it is DP, conservation doesn't play a role. Right, I mean, you know, so it's not that, so what is conserved? It's not the, what you call auto parameter or activity, that is conserved. Conserved is some other field which is present in the system, okay? So, mm, I don't know how to go about it. So basically it is, the other answer could be it is DP, conservation doesn't play a role. And there can be other scenarios also and there has been debate around that. There are long debate around these uh, scenarios, okay? So I'll go from 1990 to 2012 and let me see the first one. So the evidence which supports scenario one, okay? So what is, so there is a, uh, there are a lot of studies, but the first one which comes up is basically this one, 2004, that absorbing phase transition with additional conserved field forms a new universality class different from DP, okay? Mm, that's the first scenario. And they study many models like conserved, what is the called conserved lattice gas. So these are all conserved things, okay? And there is a tuning parameter. You tune the parameter to mostly density, and there is a critical point, and you study what is the critical behavior at the critical point, and these are the list of exponents they find, and within numerical accuracy, they start, you know, the exponents actually match, like, you know, conserved lattice gas, conserved threshold transfer process, fixed energy manna model, like, you know, this closed boundary, many other models, I'm not looking at that. This one may be named as manna class, okay? Because this is fixed energy manna sand pile, so we call it manna class or conserved class, okay? Conserved sand pile class. Okay, so this is in support and they find that the exponents are different from directed percolation. For example, beta equal to 0.38 they find and uh, for directed percolation in one dimension it is 0.27, okay? So it's a different universality class. So now uh, I will also talk about evidence in, sub in supporting scenario two. It's uh, talked about uh, by uh, Deepak uh, earlier, sticky grain models. So what, what we propose here is that, well, uh, manna model may or may not be there, but all the models, either deterministic or stochastic sand piles, they are unstable to a perturbation called stickiness, okay? So if you drop a grain and it's active, 
but it doesn't topple. So these are sticky. Okay. So if you introduce a, another parameter of stickiness, then both deterministic model and manner models actually become DP-like DP -like, uh, models. So this is this was a study uh, in 2002. So uh, so I will not describe it in details. So existing SOC models like BTW manna model or Dharnamaswamy model deterministic models, they are special. That means zero stickiness. They show non-generic behavior, non-DP. Okay, but once you use this, we show that you know they probably go to DP class. Okay, the, they flow to DP when put off. Okay, so generic SSC models are DP. That's the that's the thing. Uh, one, but it doesn't answer this question that whether manna model in, as an independent class exists or not. Okay, so if you put off, you go to DP. So now uh, evidence again another one. Uh, so there are. You know, older models, like, you know, 1989 Zhang model, which is a continuous sand pile model, like the one which I suggested, you have real numbers everywhere, and some, uh, this is the model. So here also, this is the claim that it was a direct percolation university class. And then, then a conserved continuous manna model, which we study, right, in 2012. So the model which I suggested uh, just now, like conserved continuous manna model. So this one also show uh, DP behavior. Okay, so the exponent DP is 0.59. You know, this is the exponent. This is what we get. This is the exponent. This is what we get for continuous one. Okay, so for discrete manna model, you know, these exponent match. This one we could not go below this. You know, but you know, some this exponent match. This one match. So for discrete one, you might ask a question, but the, for the continuous one, it's pretty clear that this is actually probably most probably in DP class, direct percolation class. Okay, so what? What is beta? So basically, how the activity decay to zero at the critical point? Uh, how, what is the, how the correlation length diverges as you approach the critical point? How the relaxation time diverges uh, as you approach the critical point? And this divided by that, how space and time scale, this is a dynamical exponent, and how the activity decay at the critical point if you start from a high active state. Okay, so these are the exponents. Okay, so. You know, in the in the discussion, there is many uh, you know many ways this word hyperuniformity has come up. So I would like to tell you what exactly is the hyperuniform and what was difficulty in studying this pro, 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 you know these models and how we could overcome that. Okay, so look at uh, this one. Okay, so what I what I study here is that you are mm, close to criticality, right? I mean, close to the critical point, somewhere close to critical point. You don't have to know exactly what critical point, but somewhere close is enough. What I'm looking at here is that the background density. Okay, so the curves are the fluctuation from the mean. Okay, so this is the, how the fluctuations. What, what is the fluctuation from the mean density? Okay, so when you ch change the system size. Okay, so you know you go from you know this is a system size hundred. So you're okay. So so the, yeah details. Let us drop out. So this width, right? I mean, you know, from width from zero is a fluctuation. Okay, so if you see. So black one is t equal to zero. So you have a huge fluctuation. Okay, to start with, you you start with a background which have a huge fluctuation. But if you wait like 10 to the power eight time steps, you still see huge fluctuations. Okay, the system size is uh, 10 to the power five, close to 10 to the power five. Okay, l equal to 10 to the power five. You can see that the uh, fluctuations, you know, and but fluctuations are pretty high even up to time t equal to 10 to the power eight units. Okay, and then. After 10 to the power 9, this fluctuation actually goes down and it becomes a flat. So this is a non-Gaussian fluctuation because Gaussian fluctuations would have been square root of uh, square root of this uh, j, right? I mean the volume. Okay. So this this one is not the one, and you know so you have uh, square root because I have taken a standard deviation, not the variance. This is the, some kind of standard deviation. Okay. So this is the what we call hyperuniformity. So what it means that if you wait sufficiently long, then the then the background becomes very, very flat, like the red one. Okay, so there is no fluctuation at all. So you have to wait that long, and there is some way we could avoid. I will not talk about that. We avoid by using natural initial conditions. And what you have is that if you start with the random initial conditions, the activity will go down and come up. But if you start with a natural initial condition, that goes uh, like that, flat. No, no, no. It's not sudden because in the log scale. No, no, no. Up to time t to the eight, you are very, very far away because you have this large. Flux. Yes, but ten to the power eight to ten to the power nine is ten times that. I know that, yeah. but <laughs> on the log scale, I mean, the window <laughs> is is kind of sharp. That's my question. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sharp? In log scale, it is sharp. 
I mean, whatever it means. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, it is not, because you have to write, I mean, it's continuous. So it, it's not. So it is only the, L, you know, the time is L square. So if you have to wait until L square time. So 10 to the power 10 is of the order L square. OK. So basically, that's the way we find this DP behavior. And uh, OK. So now I go to more recent studies. OK. So, uh, so, uh, the, so now question is that, you know, you have scenarios. Some way we just say that it is DP, and some other way it also say that it may not be DP. So now question is that, you know, uh, what exactly is the universality of this? So now letter papers actually suggest that density fluctuations are sublinear in volume in, in most observing critical states. So if you have a critical, you know, if you have observing phase transitions, so the critical state, absorbing critical state, critical absorbing state is hyper uniform. Okay, so sometimes it is trivially hyper uniform, like in DP, everything is flat, zero zero zero, or somewhere it can be you know non trivially, like you know some other other value, mm, but the so they are hyper uniform. So this supports the one which you said, like you know the critical absorbing state is hyper uniform, although we have not used this word. So later on, there is another work by Ledusel and who actually map this what you call manna field theory to what we already know as a uh, Edward, quenched Edward Wilkinson uh, interface model, okay? So just to say the field theory, I think it has been discussed earlier. So what you have is that, you know, you write a field theory for manna model. So this part is just like a directed percolation, like, you know, how the activity propagates. So the activity grow, die, diffuse, and um, you have a noise in the activity, but the noise is, uh, is multiplicative because the noise itself should not be generating, you know, activity anywhere. Just by noise, you should not be activating, you know, activating something. So that's a multiplicative noise. And then, then there is a density field which just uh, sees, we just see the diffusion of the activity. So that's the kind of field theory people write for, uh, of course, there is a coupling. Without that coupling, I mean, you know, that decoupled, okay? So this, without this coupling, if omega equal to zero, of course it will be DP, right? I mean, you know, because this field theory is for directed percolation. So this coupling somehow matters, okay? So now what is done in this paper in 2015 is that you, you, you with a change of variables, this is U is some other variable, it's the integrated field variable some way. So you can change this variable to get an equation which lo look like just a diffusion equation, you can put m equal to zero, you know, in this case, m can be made zero. So you have a diffusion equation with a noise. This is a, this is a force, but this, this one is, um, this one is uh, fluctuating. So this is a fluctuating thing which depends on u, okay? So some variable u. So basically, it's a diffusion equation with a noise that depends on the variable, okay? So that's what we know as a quenched Edward Wilkinson equation. So these two things are equivalent. So what, what is proved? This is a proof. Okay, what is proved is that manna field theory, whatever people write, that is same as quenched Edward Wilkinson equation. Okay, so now, and quenched Edward Wilkinson, even if you study numerically, it is not directed percolation. So it demands that the, this one cannot give you directed percolation. Okay, so this tells that manna model, which the field theory is probably for manna model, mm, there is no proof for that, but that is kind of, you know, that, so manna model cannot be in DP. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's against the, against DP. Now, um, our friend Punyabrutu. So for example, right, I mean, you know, it's a very nice one, nice work uh, of hydrodynamics. They found a relation, right, I mean, it's a previous talk, that J equal to two, mi two minus, one minus beta by nu. And uh, so this one is the new exponent relation and it is perfectly, but it is not satisfied by DP university class. So DP is not solvable, you don't know the exponents, pretty, but you know them up to three, four decimal places, very accurate. So if you put those values, this equation is not satisfied. And this is done for critical observing state with conserved density. So for MANA or Oslo or any such sand pile, this would have been true. So now question is that if it doesn't hold, that means that existence of independent MANA class is, you know, it's, it's questionable. So it's going both this way. So question that how to resolve them. So how to study? Uh, in 2016, this is with uh, Peter Grasberger, Deepak, and uh, myself. And so, what we study is that uh, Oslo model revisited. Okay, so Oslo, you probably know what is Oslo model, and which has been discussed many, many times. But I'll just for clarity, because the rest of the talk will depend on that. For clarity, I'll just say it once again for completeness. Okay, 
So what you have is that you have a, <coughs> you have a lattice <coughs> and you have some particles and <coughs> uh, it is started uh, uh, in, Osl yeah, there is an Oslo rice pile, there was experiment, this was experiment was in, uh, Oslo rice pile experiment was in Oslo, right? Yeah, so there was an experiment on sand pile models, which you, okay, I, uh... yeah, it's called Oslo rice pile model. Uh, okay, no, I, I, I don't know what is the, if I have a page for that, I don't have, I, I, it is that, yeah, okay. Sorry. Ah, yeah, here. This one is experimental plot. Okay. So this is there is some rice pile. Uh, more, so this is the, this is the plot from the experiment. So actually, in a two-dimensional plate, you put put rice and try to take coupling. So add grains here and take a tuple and see the activity. The activity look like that. You put the power law. So this is the Oslo rice pile model, and this is done in Oslo, and Oslo rice pile done by this paper, these people, great, great at all. Okay. I saw my summary, so I think you are free now. <laughs> okay, I'll go back. Okay, so uh, so the, the the model is that that you know if it is uh, somewhere, if you have more than two particles, so they are active. So for example, uh, so here you have one, two, three, three or more particles means active. So this is active, this is surely active. Uh, uh, if it is two particle. It decides whether it wants to be active or not active with probability p and one minus p. So this here is two particle. This is active, but this is not. Okay. So now, for, now this thing topple. Hmm? Now this thing topple. When it topples, so what you have is that you know if there are two particles, of course they topple. Go one, go left, one go right. This is active. This will topple. In this one, uh, so basically if it topples, it goes like that. But from here, one, two, three, four. Five, right? So now question is that you know you can tuple first two, second two, third one, it may or may not tuple now because it is two. Okay. So at this stage you decide to stay here, two, and the rest four, two here and two there. So this particular side gets one from here, two from here, so that becomes three. From the next time, this will become active, like that. Okay, that's the model. So, so now question is that uh, in this model we study in various conditions various boundary conditions, open, close, boundary driven, bulk driven. So this is boundary drive. So you means, this means that this is the dynamics in the bulk, which is conserved. You drop a particle here, take a particle at the other boundary. Okay? Particles are entered here, exit here. This is boundary driven. Then you can put a particle here and take the particles away. So if the avalanche goes to the boundary, it drops here, but this is a central driving. So you drop a particle at one particular place. You can do a random driving, like you know, anywhere here, and then take out from this one. This is the bulk drive and dissipation at the boundary. And you can also study a fixed energy version. So the number of particles are conserved like that, and you can activate this in a very nice way because here the absorbing uh, absorbing state has zero, one, and two. If you have two, that has decided not to topple, and you have stayed there. You now just can say that well, now you topple then you create activity. So without disturbing the background, you can create activity in Oslo model and that gives us a fantastic advantage in calculating the critical exponent in Oslo model. Okay? So I just wanted to say that the critical exponents are beta, it's very close to a rationals, like in you know, a 5 by 21, nu is 4 by 3. This nu is basically how the correlation length diverges, that is uh, 4 by 3. And uh, this is the, how the, uh, you know, the, the time scale diverges, it's 40 by 21. And then there are the exponents which are coming from, so this is for example, uh, this one is survival probability. So the survival probability decay as you, you know, wait longer, right? I mean, you know, if you wait more, it will decay. So it decays t to the power minus 7 by 8, okay? So these are the exponent and uh, tau is the, uh, tau is the, uh, the, the size distribution, probability size of the, size of the avalanche. Distribution is s to the power minus tau and this is, it diverges uh, at the critical point, okay. P, okay. So uh, these are simple rationals. So you might ask a question that how good, how do you know that these are simple rationals? So, you know, of course, we do it, the simulations are pretty, good, right, I mean, I just wanted to show that the simulations are good. So, uh, so look at that PS versus S, okay? So if you look at PS versus S, look at that uh, 10 to the power 10 here, huh? I mean, you know, this is, uh, and this side is one to 10 to the power minus 20, and these are the avalanche sizes, so we, we drop, 
more than 10 to the power 10 particles in the system and the system size is more than 2 to the power 18, 2 to the power 20. So it's a big system size and a lot of particles that drop and this is kind of a graph you get. So you are, you attempt, you know, you are tempted to say that there is a nice power law, but we don't do that. We also try to see that how is the deviation. So P s, s to the power uh, 14 by 9. So this is tau is 14 by 9. So if you put P s t to the power 14 by 9, this curve should have been straight. But then there is a bump here. So this is straight with a bump here. Okay. So if you increase system size, this remains straight for longer. But then I just wanted to see that how big are the fluctuations. Then we try to add corrections like s to the power tau and then, then 1 plus some s to the power some other exponent. So these are the corrections. So if you add the corrections, this one is in a very small tiny scale. It just fluctuations are very little because the corrections are taken care of. And now you have 14 by 9 is the exponent and we add 0 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 3, 0 0.0005, just change the exponent a little bit. Then you have a curve which you visible here and minus that it will be visible here. So the exponent is 14 by 9 plus minus 10 to the power 0 0.0005, okay. So that's the accuracy in the exponent and we believe that it's pretty close to a, um, then, no, no, sorry, yeah, 0 0.0005, sorry, I. So the exponent is, devia so 14 by 9 plus minus 0 0.0005, okay. So that's the kind of accuracy. So now people are bothering about hyper uniformity. So if you look at this, the variance, the variance would be proportional to L, okay. So the, but the variance versus L goes as, you know, this is the curve, like, you know, this is slope is half, square root of L. So the variance, you know, the, the number, number, numbers, number of particles in a volume V, goes as v to square root of v, not v. So this certainly breaks central limit theorem and this is what you call hyper uniformity. Now you look at, uh, in the, you know, we also study fixed energy sand pile, so version of that. So then you, you can also find beta. So the critical value is this one, right, you know, you look at the accuracy and then, you know, and you can see the value at which point zero 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 one. So, so the, you know, you can see that the, it matches very well from at least three, four, three decades. Okay. So that's the five by 21. Okay. So five by 21 plus minus point zero 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 one. Okay. So that's the kind of accuracy and we believe that these are good ones. No, but I mean, you know, so basically, you know, usually, <laughs> Uh, no, no, I mean, you know, I mean, no, we believe that, you know, not, it's not in my capacity, but probably someone else someday will find a theory for it. And for the theory, you would not be looking for an irrational number there. Probably a simple theory, if solvable, would provide only rational numbers. That's it. Okay. Do you know it? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. That number looks like root three. Critical looks very close to root. Yeah, probably. Which is not rational. <laughs> proof. But that is not exponent. This I don't want to prove that this is, I never say that this is a rational number. I never. Hmm. I say critical exponents are rational. But do you know a crit phenomena, critical phenomena, where critical phenomena, critical exponents are irrationals proved? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If you know, please tell me. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so now question is that once we know this exponent, what is next? Okay, so we know, right, I mean, this is very accurate and then uh, Oslo model, but we know that Oslo model is also mapped, right, I mean, you know, there was a mana field theory which was mapped to quenched Edward Wilkinson. Can you do a justice? Because it was only a field theory. There was no lattice model which corresponds to that field theory. So can we some way argue about that? So what we do is that we define in the Oslo model, we try to, you know, look at Oslo model as a linear interface model, okay. So how do you do it? Is that change a variable, what you call HIT, is the number of toplings, toplings at i up to time t, okay. That's my variable HIT and if I do some calculations, like, you know, this is just write the dynamics of Oslo model, how things evolve, you can find out, you know, discrete, these are discrete derivatives, like, you know, discrete Laplacian, you know, you take a continuum limit, so that is just that. It's just a diffusion equation with a noise eta, but eta depends on both height and its, you know, its curvature, okay. So, so this is just a diffusion equation with that. You know, if, if, it done, if this eta is just a simple, uh, simple Gaussian noise, then you know that it's Edward Wilkinson, okay. If it's just a simple Gaussian noise. And if it is, eta depends only on h, then you call it, uh, quenched Edward Wilkinson, right? I mean, you know, it's like that with a coefficient a h, 
Okay, so it's a delta correlated with a coefficient a which depends on h only. Okay, so that is quenched Edward Wilkinson. And what we find here is that h, it noise depends on both h and its curvature. So the locally, the noise depends on the, the, the height and its curvature locally. Okay, so now question is that uh, should it be should it be, should it be in the same university class and this one or that one or whatever? So what we find surprisingly for these kind of models, people know the exponent. And what we find in Oslo model, we you know the exponents match with this one. Okay, so now let us see that how to what people study in interface models. Okay, so when the interface grows, you know that you know maybe in a previous uh, people know this. So just so width. Like, you know, width is just mean, you know, difference from the mean and square it and average it. So this width goes as L to the power alpha tilde and T to the power beta tilde, okay, for large, large T and large L, okay. So uh, this is the one which you side height fluctuations. And in Edward Wilkinson, this alpha is half. So it means, you know, if you, if you have Edward Wilkinson surface, then the, the fluctuations you get is square root of L, I mean, in one dimension. And if you have a KPG, then this is also half, square root of L, okay? So uh, this, and what we, uh, what people know uh, in quenched Edward Wilkinson is that this is uh, five by close to one point, like, you know, so numerical value is 1.23. I mean, you know, that's what previous estimate. And what we find is that in our model, it is very close to five by four with that much of accuracy, okay? So you think that probably for quenched Edward Wilkinson, which was studied earlier, so the best exponents are probably this one, that, you know, 5 by 4, beta is 7 by 8, and uh, z equal to beta alpha, you can just use scaling argument, just prove that. This times that equal to that, alpha equal to beta z. Okay, so now, so, so if you look at the, you know, look at the Oslo model as an interface, then you get exponents alpha tilde and beta tilde, 5 by 4 and this, and look at this, 5 by 4 and half, so it's a super rough. Right, I mean, so, right, I mean, this quest Edward Wilkinson or what you call Oslo model as an interface, it is super rough, like, you know, it's more than, more than L. Okay. Okay, so what we learn from here is that the dynamics of Oslo model can be mapped to quest Edward Wilkinson. Self-organized criticality and fixed energy sand piles, which you study, you know, all of them together, they give you similar, same exponents, so that's kind of, you know, same with respect to critical exponents. And uh, we don't have a, yeah, and, uh, and what we learn is that if you look at, you know, so now let us know what is the rational, okay? So what is the DP and things like that, okay? So what, let us summarize this here. So we have Manna field theory and this link, Manna and Quenched Edward Wilkinson was given by Ledusel earlier. And uh, what we did is that Oslo model, we, def we, we take as a lattice model and we saw that it can be mapped to quench Edward Wilkinson interface, okay? So given this link, so this link is complete. So which tells you that Oslo model is the correct lattice model for the Manna field theory, okay? And the exponents which you have listed earlier, so those are the exponent. So now given this is a scenario, you can say that the whole thing, this picture may be termed as a Manna class, okay? Whatever you get here can be termed as a Manna class. So, and it also says that independent Manna class indeed exists, okay? And Oslo model is a microscopic model belonging to this class. Okay. So that is, that's the one which we study. So what is left out? Left out is the question on Manna model, the one which we give DP. Question is that, is Manna model in Manna class? Okay, the one original model, does that model belong to the same university class? That's the question which is not answered yet. It's not also, uh, you know, not uh, like the exponent relation would not hold. I'll tell you later that, you know, the exponent. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, so, but that's, that's the question which is still bothering us, like, you know, it is not uh, settled yet. So what makes some models belong to DP class? Because we know that there are models which belong to DP class, and, you know, according to Konjav, according to Punyo, Grotho, and studies, so hydrodynamics tells you that there cannot be absorbing phase transition in a Konjav system which belongs to DP class, because that doesn't satisfy that relation. And uh, so which university class is robust? Like, you know, what are the flows, right? I mean, you know, so, the other scenario is that is it the idea, is that the idea which you have earlier, like, you know, all stochastic sand pile models belong to one university, maybe that is wrong, but maybe there are many university classes here, so maybe stochastic sand piles have many university classes, so we we'll try to explore this, particularly this one, in next, next eight minutes, okay.
So what do we term, what do we want to term the next model, which is, uh, is that clipped linear interface model, okay? So let me define this model, and uh, this is not solved, our work is ongoing, but this gives us a lot of interesting stuff. So let us start with the diffusion equation. I mean, you know, everybody recognize that. Now, you discretize in space and time. So if you discretize this equation, you get this equation, okay? So replace, replace a site by the average of the neighbors, okay? If you keep doing, it will homogenize the system, and that's the one the diffusion process is, okay? So now, after this, it is fine, just simple diffusion. Then all we want to do is that, let us say restrict n to be, be non-negative. We want to put, you know, because if you do this, you start with the integer, it will make real numbers after some time, because one fourth and, you know, it just, so now we want to, let us say that, you know, we want to keep integers. So how do we do? So now question that if this one is a half integer, add plus minus half, with probability p plus minus half, and if it is even integer, if it is just an integer, sorry, this is wrong, if it is an integer, then you add zero and plus minus one. This is a mistake. And if it is zero, do nothing. Okay. So if it is zero, do nothing, half integer add this, so then the integer, you remain in the integer set, and particularly you remain in the positive integer set. Okay, try to be know. So that's the question, and now, now how many parameters are there? Because this probability add up to one, and uh, these three also add up to one, so you have p half here, and p zero and p one here. Okay, so there are three variables. Okay, so you have, in, so the general model is that nit equal to this, plus n is eta, eta equal to zero, if the input, this I call input is zero, this, inter, this is input is zero, and the input is odd, then it is plus minus half with probability that, and that's the model, okay? This, this looks like a simple modification on diffusion equation, They're very innocent. But then, uh, so we have three parameters, this, and P zero plus P one is less than one, so this is a triangle, and P half is zero to one, so this is a prism, okay? So the, I'm sorry? No, you don't, you're not conserving mass, okay? So now, uh, so given this as a situation, so we want to find out, are there, there must, so basically once given, once it is, you know, the, the parameter space is given, in the parameter space, you can see that adding plus minus half basically means that it, it is growing, like if you plus half, then things should grow. So now question is that if you can add, if you add more than you can uh, delete or evaporate, then, you know, you can, you know, it will go to infinity and just diverse, okay? So there is a surface which will just separate the finite avalanche or finite n average to infinity n average state and there's a new surface and that surface should be critical, okay? And you want to study the critical behavior of that surface, okay? Okay, so now uh, we change a variable. X equal to P1 minus P minus one. This is the difference and Z is P0. So once you do that, then let us say that the prism is now again minus one to one because x is on minus one to one. And in this prism, there are these four quadrants. Here, x basically means that the difference between, so if x is positive, then means, uh, then the x mean, uh, this, that means the, uh, uh, if you input is uh, integer, then it will grow, okay? So y positive means that if half, in, so, so now question is that here everything grows, this quadrant, so that it has to be an infinity avalanche. And this quadrant, everything n goes to zero. So this must be in this side. So there must be a line here. I mean, you know, that's the argument. There has to be a line here, okay? I mean, and that, there is a line here, okay? And turns out that universality class of this is direct at percolation, except at x equal to y equal to zero. This point is a different universality. Rest of them is directed percolation universality class, numerically. Okay. But you know, one can prove that, you know, although you allow n to take all possible values, in this region, it will take only zero and one values, like, you know, here, it, you can see, so that, yeah. Okay, so now I take the whole phase plane, like, you know, all you wanted to know here, there is a surface, and now I'm drawing the surface because I don't have time, I think, you know. So basically, that's the prism and that's the surface. So in the surface, a lot of points and things we know. So for example, I, you know, uh, you know, this face, like, you know, the face which is here, this face uh, is like a Dominic Angel cellular automata, if you know this, okay? So basically this line is exactly the critical line, exactly, it's mapped to Dominic Angel cellular automata on this surface. So this one is this Dominic Angel cellular automata, this side is, uh, this side is P1 and this side is P2. So P2, so this side is, so P1 equal to half. When P2 equal to one, P1 equal to half. P1, P2 is uh, just how, you know, when your neighbors are active, one or both neighbors are active, 
P1, Pi1, and Pi2 are the uh, are the probabilities that you activate that. So Pi1 is 1 plus y by 2, Pi2 is this. So that's the line which you know. So similarly, uh, so this, so the other universality class, so x, okay, x equal to 0 equal to y and p 0 equal to 1. So this endpoint of this is a compact dp. So this universality class you know. And uh, this point, as I say that this is the new universality class, we called it, uh, you know, clipped Edward Wilkinson because nothing grows. It's just, you know, fluctuating thing and uh, there is no bias here. And, but there is a, there is a bottom, right? I mean, you know, you, below n, below zero, it cannot go below zero, so it's clipped. So there is a, the universality class of this is different from what we know as quenched Edward Wilkinson, okay? And uh, then P1 plane, so if you go to this plane, the other side of that, there is also a, the surface actually cuts it here, that is a different universality class that is called clipped Carver Paris is hung, okay? That's a clipped KPG. That's a different universal class altogether. That's the one where, uh, you know, if you uh, remember, uh, right, you know, the, uh, Deepak's talk. So this is the one where we have clusters, which is uh, kind of growing and it's very difficult to measure the critical exponent of this one. So these are the very different universal class. We know a lot of things. I don't uh, know, uh, you know, about this, about the critical one. But, uh, so this one is known exactly. This one is known. Uh, dp exponents as you whatever it, we can map it but we do not do not know the exponents this one is hard to study and we are still uh, confused about this confused basically it takes time for us to settle okay so now what you study is the avalanche so what i study is that four different directed percolation compact so there are four universality class here and clipped Edward Wilkinson and Carver Paris Jang. So these are given by the symbols. And what we study is that avalanche statistics, avalanche size distribution, which you call Cx goes as x to the power minus tau x plus one. And Cx is the probability that size is greater than x. What is size? This x is either total number of toplings, then I call it s, or distinct sites in the cluster, or duration of the avalanche. So all of them is a power law and the power, powers are different. So this is well known, this is directed percolation, and this is also well known, this is a compact dp, four by three, this is like cluster size distribution. It's a cumulative distribution, cumulative distribution of cluster size, you know, this four, you know, so, uh, so, and that is 10 by seven, okay? Tau is 10 by seven, not the slope, okay? So slope is one point, so whatever. So, so that's the, when we study, and here, like, you know, this is uh, D, and uh, D means distinct cluster. So, so because each site can topple multiple times, the number of distinct sites in the cluster and total number of topplings are different. It's not like BTW model, they're same, okay? So, for, for example, this one, it is four by three, and that one is also four by three. I mean, you know, that has to be same because there's only, each site topple only once, like, you know, in the deterministic BTW model. Okay, and this one is the most troublesome one, and you can see that you know we go very lo in a long time, but you still could not fix it. Okay, I, I can take two minutes more, and then we can. Uh... So now spreading of activity on random backgrounds. Okay, so that's the one also discussed. So what you start is that. Uh, uh, so how does and I mean this? How does this model relate to the Oslo model? Okay, so this random interface model, you know, uh, they relate to Oslo model in a way that you know you take a uh, lattice like that. And a priori, you fill the system with poison, you know, poison distributed numbers like in 0, 1, and 2 with probability C0, C1, C2. You fill this up, okay? So if you do that, and on this background, if you want to run this Oslo dynamics, then what will happen is that this Ni is the number of toplings, okay? So if this side, you know, this side is Ni minus 1 topples that many times, this one topples that many times, that means these plus these grains arrive here. And depending on how many grains you get from the background, that is jitta, you, this, you topple accordingly. Like this one divided by two and you know, whatever here, right? I mean, so this equation directly looks like what we have here, but then P minus half relates to C0, C1, and C2 with these relations. Okay? So this can be calculated, this is simple calculations. Okay? So this is a restricted spreading of activity on random background is a restricted clean. Right, I mean, we have a bigger phase diagram. This one is a subset in that phase diagram. So, and uh, so in a very special case, like you know, if you take C0 equal to this, C1 equal to this, this corresponds to directed Oslo model with this kind of you know steady state. Okay, so that particular one, 
C0 equal to this, this correspond to this line, this point and along with this line, whole line. So this is the directed Oslo model, okay. And now um, I just summarize. So what I, uh, okay. I did not wait for questions, but I will take it later. So let me summarize it. So as a summary, we study four different ways of studying sand piles. One is self-organized criticalities, like you know, you have drive and dissipation. One is fixed energy. You don't have, you have conservation and absorbing, you will look for absorbing state phase transitions. We can do it field theory, like you know, if you can write a field theory and integrate and you have some exact results here. And you can also study them as elastic interfaces, surface growth or fluctuation. So, right, I mean, you know, this is super, super fluctuations in these kind of sand piles, Oslo models, okay? And also we study that Oslo sand piles belongs to Quest Edward Wilkinson University class. You may name it as Manna class, okay? And this picture is pretty complete with these exponents. And what we also kind of conjecture is uh, stochastic sand pile probably has many, many different university classes, okay? Not many, many, at least many, <laughs> okay? So I stop there and uh, thank you. <laughs>